as a part of our Todd's that uh, there be very comprehensive uh, discussions about stationary planning that's really around our, our, our stations. Uh, it needs to be zoned, it needs to have the requirements in place, it's everything from parking ratios, uh, and here we're talking about maximum parking rather than minimum parking requirements, um, and a whole series of other things that are there. Um, and that is, uh, I think, what really makes the, the, the Todd work well. We require, for example, in residential buildings that the first floor is reserved for mixed uses because if you don't have the coffee shop or the restaurant or the dry cleaner you can go to, then you are going to have to get that vehicle to get to those things. We want that to be a part of that walking, biking, public transit uh, community. So I don't think there's one definition. I think it's something that, that again, uh, it needs to be a part of that design. Uh, uh, Laura Lee is here. I, I guess that she would say the same thing uh, about how much uh, you need to be able to design that in a way uh, that really addresses the different needs. But it's got to be good design. It has to be able to be um, good. Two more questions. Yes. Uh, my name is Lyon Lopez. I'm president of the Residents Association of uh, in Walker Satellite Incorporated. And uh, again, I'm, I've tried to keep an open mind about developments and stuff like that, but um, often things like open space, which you say is a good thing, uh, it seems to be referred to as unused space. And I've, I've watched you know, other, other areas where development has been going on sitting in place. And you've talked about designs being really important, and I've really enjoyed your the vision you brought to here, but you must have sensed already there's quite a sense of disillusion uh, with sort of pseudo consultation processes, open space being referred to as unused space, um, bikes, it, well, they, bikes being left off of uh, consideration uh, like railways, you know, there's no space for them, and all sorts of stuff like that, you know, no, no space for pedestrians or certain new bridges, unless it gets pushed from below. Now, my only question really is, I mean, this is fantastic what you said, you brought a sense of vision, but this is what the community here has been seeking for years, it's just sort of this big vision, you know, and we haven't seen that really coming through to us in a realistic way. So my question is, why weren't you here three or four years ago at the design stage? Uh, obviously, uh, you're speaking to a lot of uh, detailed history that, that I don't have. I would say, in my six days that I've been here today, I've been talking about such things with government uh, uh, and at the most senior levels, um, talking about things such as uh, uh, open space, parks, uh, other things. I've not heard uh, the, uh, the phrase unused uh, or underutilized. I've heard, how do we really do this better? How do we really think uh, fundamentally uh, about these things? How do we really make this a place where people want to be able to be? Uh, and to recognize that that consultation process uh, is a very, very important part of it. So I would say what I've heard uh, would leave me optimistic that whatever have been the sins of the past, um, that there is a real understanding that things uh, are different uh, as going forward. Uh, and I say that very sincerely from the people that I've been talking to just over the last six days. Obviously the proof is in the pudding, uh, as you well know. Thank you. Uh, Richard Hansler from Oregon. Oregon. Um, I thought you said Oregon at first. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Uh, your public transport in Portland seems to be fantastic. It's almost like our go zone is 24 7, uh, 365 days a year, if I can understand it. And I was just wondering if you could give a couple of uh, insights into one, I suppose, the cost of that and whether what special taxes you might, um, you might raise or whether there's levies on some things in order to fund that. And the other one, I suppose, is, both, is the parking issue, whether what your view is on parking both at the origin, origin end for the TODs and I suppose at the destination end of your commuting state of the CBD. Uh, whether, how you, um, what your view, I suppose, is the amount of parking which can be provided or is provided. There's a lot in the city, for instance, the city of Adelaide, and whether there's uh, ways and means of just pure efficiency and uh, frequency of services which brings the ridership that you're getting into. Um, well, the first issue uh, around the, the frequency of service and, and how that works, 
Uh, I mean, as a long-term transit user, I, I think my, my instincts probably took over rather than hard uh, analysis uh, to be able to, to establish our frequent service, uh, that is, that 15-minute um, all day long, into the evenings, on Saturdays and Sundays, that, that really sense of, of predictability. Because I, as a user of the system, I know what it means, how you think about it, how the, the, the typical transit user works, and how that all kind of comes together. And so I think that type of, uh, of service is very important. We, in the Portland region, uh, pay for uh, much of our operation. We all, uh, fare box recovery, uh, what we call fare box recovery, that is how much of the fare box pay, about 21%. Average in the U.S. is about 25%, so we're a little bit lower. Uh, if we didn't want to run as many hours, we could probably get it up to well over 25%, but we think that service is very important. Um, most of our funding, we are a, a non-sales tax state. As a result, most of our funding can't come from what most transit systems in the United States do, have an extra quarter cent or half cent on sales tax uh, and pay for it. We have what's called a payroll tax. That is a tax paid by employers based on the, w, the, the employee wages. Um, the employee doesn't have to pay it, but it's, uh, it's paid. Uh, currently, it's at about 0.7% of, uh, of wages uh, and pays for about 57% of our, of our overall service. Uh, that frequent service bus lines, you ask kind of whether it's, you know, kind of, you know, not pretty costly to be able to run them all that time. Um, there are real workhorses, 16 bus lines. Uh, they carry uh, about a little bit under 60% of our riders uh, and use about 45% uh, of our service hours. So they're really the workhorses out there. That is, they carry lots. Uh, and are really, if you think about it, you have the rail for the really high capacity transit, the backbone of the system. You have the frequent bus as the major bus side on the arterials, and then you have local, uh, local bus service that tends to be less efficient. We try to be able to make it as efficient as we can, but some places are, are pretty hard. Uh, on parking, uh, we, uh, we always wrestle with that. How much parking should we really have? Um, and you, if you, you do travel shed analysis, you look at where uh, locations are, uh, how people can get to it. Uh, you know, our ideal, of course, is that people uh, take transit, take walking or biking to transit, and take transit for their whole trip. Um, that's not possible in some settings, and therefore you have to have some choices in it. Um, uh, kiss and ride are, is a possibility of that. That's one of the ways to be able to make it, the really drop off spot. But I think that there ought got to be a whole series of strategies to be able to get to that. And the uh, uh, ride-wise, uh, smart uh, uh, ride uh, efforts, where you really go into people's living rooms and talk through with them how to, to be able to reorient their, uh, their lifestyle to be able to make use of public transit. Spend the upfront, uh, but produces pretty impressive results. So I think there's got to be a whole series of strategies, but the goal ought to be to have people have to use.